Ali's no, thanks, Ali. Yeah, my apologies. Ali's just spotted that um, I was on mute, um, and so I apologise for that. But um, good catch from Ali there. Um, so yeah, every week we do this webinar. We appreciate you know that that people come along to it. Um, we do our collaborations, and we do our jobs. Um, we also sort of talk about jobs and positions at Zimmer and Peacock as well. Great. And Ali's just confirmed that I have unmuted myself, so thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, Ali. You're always um, quality controlling me, so thank you very much. Um, and here's the ZP Developer Zone webinar. Uh, we're also talking about doing a, um, a biosensor school, and that will be something that we'll be organizing as well. Um, now, the this webinar... Um, as I um, and just just because I was muted earlier, I just want to remind you that the news um, and the news vlog and podcast that we used to do on eight pm Sundays has now moved to eight am on Sundays. We're not expecting you to watch it live, but just to let just in case you do turn up, just to say that 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 webinar that we used to do on Sundays at eight pm London time moved to eight am um, London time on um, High Hitcher um, has now moved to um, eight am on Sundays. So the questions that we had in this week, I actually posted a couple of questions myself, things that I wanted to discuss. So um, so I, I must admit that it's me that you can see also having posted some questions in the forum as well. Um, but it was a simple question. Somebody was asking the difference between two of our gold electrodes, which I'll be happy to talk about. And um, I will also talk about extraction efficiency in food samples, which I think will be quite it's interesting to me and also Ali, who's one of our ZP Developer Zone members, I think he's got a strong analytical background, so it'll kind of be interesting to hear his thoughts um, around sample preparation. You know, there's two sides when it comes to sensing. You've got the sensor itself, but also that kind of ex um, that sample preparation, so it'll be um, interesting to have a little discussion about that, so we will. And um, also I want to talk about salinity as well. Um, we'll go from conductivity to salinity but i will discuss uh, measuring salinity or saltiness today as well um first thing i want to talk about is you know we have something called um food sense um the first sort of analyte let's say or sample type that we actually developed it for was for uh, measuring the hotness of chilies so you know there's a molecule in chilies called capsaicin and you know we can take Things like, you know, I mean, that we started with Tabasco sauce because it was just, um, you know, it's so um, it's so prevalent um, both in the US and, and Europe that we, we went with that. And you can sort of take a sample of the Tabasco sauce, you can put it in buffer and you can put it on your sensor and you'll get a, um, a good repeatable result. Um, just as an FYI, the biggest adopter of the chili sensors actually in Japan, we've sold so many in japan it's unbelievable i think it's i think it's both because they are a big producer maybe of chili products but also it sort of talks to their interest in accuracy and and quality control so just as an fyi japan is the place where this um, goes a lot now when you're talking about a chili um, i'll talk about a paper later on where actually um, the university of minnesota have actually been measuring chilies using um, this product but when you look at chili products you know you kind of have chili as one type of product or type of sample you have very smooth sources like tabasco sauce and then you kind of have these much more chunky sort of products where you know it's sort of roughly chopped up chili and you, you know it'll be in an oil um, and um, you'll have oils in there and seeds in there and fruit in there you know and that's a much more um, let's say heterogeneous sample whereas you know some sources are much more sort of um, homogeneous or homogeneous depending on um, which part of the globe you're in but there are sort of you know two ends of the spectrum at least there's heterogeneous and homogeneous and then you've got the chilies themselves which are kind of solid now let me talk about you know the repeatability if you if you've got a sample like a tabasco sauce it's very blended it's very smooth. I would describe it as quite uh, quite hom homogenous. Whereas obviously, when you've got roughly cut um, products, then it's quite heterogeneous. If I sort of zoom in on this, um, 
Hi Sarah Vannon, nice to see you this morning, appreciate it. When you zoom in on a product like this, what you see is there's seeds in here, you know, so there's a certain amount of capsaicin in the seeds. There's oil in here. So capsaicin um, is very lipophilic. It's much better to dissolve it in organic solvents and um, let's say oils. Um, and then you have, let's say fruit itself, the skin of the chili um, berry um, itself. So when you look at these heterogeneous products, you know, you've, you've essentially got, you know, all these different phases, um, you know, an oily phase, a solid phase in terms of the seeds, uh, sort of, I'm not saying gel, but a softer phase, you know, like the um, berry um, skin itself. And so when you're, when you're looking at a product like that, you're actually, you know, and you're trying to measure it, what do you measure? Because if you just measured the oil, you would get one type of capsaicin because there's a certain amount of capsaicin in the oil. If you try to extract the seed, you'd get another type of capsaicin because there's a certain amount of capsaicin in the seed. And if you um, tested the fruit, you would get a different answer because there's a certain amount of um, in, uh, capsaicin in the fruit. So I just, first of all, saying, you know, that, you know, there we are. We make this um, product for measuring the hotness of chili products. Um, but you can actually have quite extremes in chili products. You can have very homogeneous samples and very heterogeneous samples. And with the homogeneous samples, it's much simpler because essentially, you know, it's everything's mostly the same throughout the sample. So it doesn't matter where you sample from, you're going to get the same amount of capsaicin. Whereas if you have a chunky, lumpy product like this, where you sample from is actually quite important because the capsaicin is not necessarily evenly distributed throughout the product. It's, it's just not. Um, now our guys, um, when they're, you know, trying to help somebody with accuracy and precision, when I say our guys, our scientists, um, will sometimes suggest to them, you know, blend it. So, you know, get all the, get it, you know, really get all the chunks out essentially. So they, you know, they'll sort of tell people to blend it and they'll also sometimes tell them to vortex it. Um, so, you know, when you vortex it, you're already sort of accelerating the extraction of capsaicin. Um, so you're, they're essentially telling you to make it into a more homogenous um, sample. Um, now, personally, I know that that is not the practice, you know, that's not always practical, and not what people want to do. I mean, the point is, you know, when you do an electrochemical sensing system like this, you want it to be simple. You take the meter um, in fact, I've got a meter up here, so let me just grab it for a second. You know, you know, this is the whole point about Zimmer and Peacock, really. You know, you, you have a meter, you have a sensor, you put the sensor in there, you put the sample on the sensor, and you should be able to do the analysis. You know, that's a kind of razor detra. That's what we do. Um, so in terms of sometimes when we give advice, you know, people say, oh, I want accuracy and precision on measuring my chili product. And then you discover that their chili product is quite heterogeneous. You know, so you've got a sample that's not, let's say, um, the same throughout. But people do, when they sample it, want a reproducible result. So one way of doing that is to blend it like crazy, vortex it like crazy, make it a very homogenous sample. And um, then when you sample from it, you should get a sort of consistent sample and therefore a consistent result. Now... Um, the reason, the reason that, that people, you know, that they're advising people to blend, obviously, is because what we're often doing is we're saying to people, take your sample, put it into our buffer, and then test the buffer on the on the sensor itself. Because when it's chunky like this, you know, you've got fairly large chunks. But if we tell you to blend it and vortex it, then you have a lot finer chunks, um, and the let's say the it's more homogeneous. But also, you know, by making the particles smaller, our rate or efficiency of extraction, you know, is, in my opinion, you know, it's generally proportional to the surface area of the lumps and chunks. So I should say inversely proportional, in fact. The smaller the lumps and chunks, then the more easy it is. There's a bigger surface area. It's easy to extract the capsaicin from them. Another way of often increasing um, extraction efficiency is to heat. It generally makes things more soluble when you raise the temperature. And then the other way of increasing extraction rate is is to um, mix very fast. So that's why they tell them to vortex. So we 
are advising people when they kind of come to us and say, oh, I want to really... Ah, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So Ali's just suggesting sonication as well. I think that's a good point. I think sonication would actually work really well. Yeah, especially on the sort of... Um, the berry, the berry part of this, if it was being sonicated, because it would really smash up the, the cells. So that's why I wanted to bring... Um, yeah, that's why I wanted to bring this to the forum because I just had a, a piece of advice off sonication is a good idea. And sonication is actually not that hard because you can buy these kind of jewelry, jewelers sonicators that they use for cleaning rings and stuff. And I got a suspicion those are not expensive. But yeah, so sonication is also a good idea because sonication, it, it gives you um, the temperature effect. Um, you know, it's a pressure wave, so it kind of sort of breaks things up. It helps with mixing. So sonication is a, yeah, is a really good idea, actually. So that's why I brought it to the forum, because I knew that, you know, the more brains I brought, we, we discussed this, then the better it was. So actually, yes, so thank you. So, of course, the big thing is that people don't want to necessarily have to work up the sample um, that much, you know, and, I, and, and we sort of understand that. So let me talk about... I'm actually just a slight divergence. There's actually quite an interesting paper out there by um, the University of Minnesota. Um, there's a guy there, uh, a Charles there, who's a, um, a professor there. He did a quite a nice paper where he compared the um, food sense and its chili sensing to HPLC. And he's actually, you know, I've spoken to him. He's spoken to other people and he's told them, no, he likes this product. He likes the fact that, you know, it is relative to HPLC it's lower cost simple and then much more simple so there's an interesting paper out there um, and I'll put a link to that paper as well just for um, interest so three ways forwards I would say this is more general this, this discussion is more general than just chili um, but you know if you've got a heterogeneous sample I say here you could make it homogeneous by blending and vortexing but the team here online have also said um, sonication I think that's a um, quite a good idea actually sonication if you don't want to do that you know then this is the sort of lazy way test three times and take the average but I think um, people are doing that and and, for, and in Japan they actually do that a lot they actually do it they test five times take the average um, and they're kind of happy with it. They do look at the coefficient of variance. You know, they take the standard deviation, they divide it by the mean, you know, make sure their coefficient of variance is sort of like 5 to 10%, which they often get, and they're happy with that. So in a quality control system in Japan, I know that they will not do any complicated workup, but they'll test five times, get five answers, take the average, calculate the standard deviation, and as long as their coefficient of variance is about 5 to 10%, they're happy. So you can do that way. Um, the other way is just consistency. Consistently sample the same part of the uh, of the sample. So what I terrible I've used this word sample twice in there. But what I mean by that is, you've got this um, heterogeneous sample. You know, be consistent. Or what is it in the sample that you're always going to test? I'm not suggesting the seed. It's a bit of a pain. Um, maybe the oil. Um, maybe you know extract the fruit, but. If you don't want to do a complicated workup, and by a complicated workup, I would I would have meant um, blending and vortexing. Though the members of the ZP Academy have just suggested, not ZP Academy, ZP developers have just mentioned sonication, which is also quite good. Um, if you don't want to do that, then I would suggest, as they do in Japan, test five times, take the average and standard deviation. Or if you just want to do one test, just have a protocol where you say, my sample is heterogeneous, sample this part of the sample um, and just be sort of let's say done with it um, it sort of tells you that this this perception of hotness is kind of interesting because you know depending on what part of the heterogeneous sample you eat if you eat a seed that's one type of hotness if you taste the oil that's another type of um, hotness and if you eat the um, let's say the berry skin that's another type of hotness but if you want consistent results from a heterogeneous sample blend it up smash it up extract it that's one way of doing it do repeatable testing or just say to yourself no i'm only going to test this this particular fraction of my sample and i'll do it always to only test let's say the oil and then i will have um, consistent results so that would be my sort of suggestion i appreciate the um 
the guys this morning just talking about sonication as well because we hadn't done it but it's, it's a good point if you want to extract something sonication is a good idea um, slight different um, direction now we've been having a conversation about these 3D printed flow cells um, for a while these are freely available to all members of the ZP developer zone we've been doing talks about it for a couple of weeks um, just to say um, that Aftab who's um, our distributor and a member of the ZP developer zone um, he's also now printed this on his 3d printer so just FYI and it's 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 available so um, in India if you haven't got a 3d printer or you haven't got CAD skills um, etc and you want one of these um, flow cells for your um, screen printer electrode and biosensor work then um, it's to cat it's um technando that you would like to contact and i'll put the um a link to them um, down below so this is what aftab's up to and this is um what he's actually made so they're um, pretty cool um and as i say if you're in india and you haven't got um the engineers or the skills hi aftab nice to see you then um, please contact them so i'm just answering some questions that came in um from one of our zp developers and members he was asking do i put the sample here um, FYI, no, you put the sample here on one of our screen printed electrodes, so you cover up the counter electrode, the working electrode, and the reference electrode. So just make sure that you don't just cover up the little black line. Unfortunately, you need all the electrodes, so make sure you, you cover up like that. So one of our um, ZP developers own members, this is his setup. So he was asking me to comment um, on his experiment. So, you know, he's got, you know, obviously we've got his laptop, He's got his Anna Pot in the background. He's got his um, lactate sensor in here. I've had a look at his settings. So he's on amperometry, which is good. Um, he's got, you know, the range is right. You know, he, we're expecting a signal, you know, really in the range of, you know, nanoamps to some hundreds of microamps. But strictly speaking, we're expecting his signal in the 10, 1 and sort of 100 nanoamps. But this is completely fine. I've looked at his equilibrium time, his poise voltage is 650 millivolts, which for a generation one lactate sensor is correct because it produces hydrogen peroxide. This is his um, save rate one, um, let's say one data point per second, and then he's running it for 600 seconds. It's probably worth doing longer experiments than this, but um, should be fine. Um, and I sort of had a zoom in and had a good look at that, so it all looks um, pretty fine. I'm assuming that he's using the this particular part number, the ZPS LAC, you know, triple zero, triple zero six two. So just make sure I've got that right. Now, we often do these experiments in a stirred reactor. So we expect to kind of every time we add the lactate to get these kind of staircases. Um, and his setup is also like that, you know, that he's got you know, essentially a stirrer running here, the sensor in, you know, should be in the solution and his laptop. So he is set up like that. And he has been um, sending me his signals and, you know, I agree, I don't, I don't see much of a response. So this is, you know, something that I'm trying to troubleshoot with him, um, you know, and help him along. One of some tips that I might just give is sometimes these connectors, I've got a, you know, there's a, there's three there's three points of the connector um, and this you know they you've really got to get these three pads lined up with these three connectors I'm absolutely sure he is doing this because he's you know he's in part an engineer but that does sometimes happen that people don't get these that pad should essentially contact there the middle pad should contact that middle pad and that pad should contact there sometimes people don't get that right it's such a simple thing and um, it's you know it's it's not really their fault you know it's it's the connectors fault let's say um, but just to make sure that alignments correct I think the biggest thing that happens is I know we call them lactate sensors um, but actually it's really lactic acids you need to test with so if you're using like sodium lactate to test your um, and I, you know we're lazy because we call them lactate sensors but we should really call them lactic acid sensors test with lactic acid not lactate I seems I know it seems like a very trivial point, and I understand that even even in buffer, you know, well, it doesn't really matter if I put lactate in or lactic acid. You know, it should all, you know, equilibrate and be the same species, especially in a buffer. 
But honestly, we've we've tested with lactate, sodium lactate. We can't get a signal. We test with lactic acid, we get a signal. So just make sure you're testing with lactic acid, not lactate. It's such a, I know, such a nuance, but honestly, it makes all the difference when testing these lactic acid sensors. Um, I know one thing we've I've seen them I've seen these sensors used in animal models and they definitely respond um, to um, anaerobic um, conditions so I've looked at his data you know so he has here you know his signal and he's adding in either zero and then one millimolar and then it's zero and then one millimolar but I, I do take his point see that in fact he's responding um, but he's responding in the opposite way that he would have expected. In fact, no, this one's responding correctly. That is zero. He adds in one millimolar, he gets a signal. He adds in one millimolar, he gets a signal. Now, what's happening here is he's probably still really, his sense is still equilibrating. So here he's being a little quick in starting the experiment. It would have been better to wait um, after 500 seconds so that he truly reached baseline and then done the testing. But... You know that's just a small thing because when I when I look at this data, this is a bit more curious. See that here, he's adding the um, lactic acid. Um, it's actually signals going down. Then he goes back to zero and the signal goes up and then down. So it's it's going in the opposite direction to what we're expecting. So it is, let's say, weird. I would say if he was an undergraduate, I would have said you've you you've mixed the solutions up. You know, but. You know he's not an undergraduate he's you know he's so i so i i don't think it is that but i would have i, w I would have generally said god you've got the solutions labeled up wrong and testing them wrong so you know it's a curious one to me um at the moment so let me plow on a bit because i am looking at this data when i look at this data i see see i find this quite encouraging because what i see here is a baseline that he's added lactate and it's responded so i got a suspicion he is actually um getting signal in fact what he's done now is he's now changed his configuration so rather than being in the beaker and stirred he's worried that that wasn't working properly so now he's doing his dropping on solutions so when i read this actually i think this tells me the sensor is working because what's happening i think what i'm seeing here is he's actually maybe in buffer he adds the lactate or the lactic acid hopefully and he gets this response now what he's saying here is i don't get much difference between adding one millimolar and 10 millimolar um that it's not stirred so i'm not that surprised um let's say but i would say one thing that we do lose linearity at you know 10 millimolar is extreme for us so we wouldn't i wouldn't expect to get a linear response from zero one two three four five six seven eight nine ten L the enzyme is really wimpy um Yeah, 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 yeah. He said that's that's right. I'm just reading Ali's comments. I agree that sometimes um, lactic acid is really wimpy. When you try to add too concentrated lactic acid, it won't respond. You know, the sensor will work pretty well. You know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but ten is excessive, so it won't show you linearity up to ten. I got a feeling, so I'm not too surprised by this, but I would agree that you would expect the tend to be higher than the one um so in some ways i am a little i can see the sensor working but i am a little bit um let's say it's not the it's not the results i would have expected so what i was thinking about doing with this was actually organizing um, a live streaming um, demo where we would essentially just go live on youtube and do a demo from our side so i will um, hopefully host that next week um, give me a shout the inquirer and we will get a live streaming I know we gave you a live streaming demo but we'll do another one because it's our commitment you know that if we if people are gonna work with us then we'll work with them you know and that's the way we'll do it so we do we do have to do a demo because I did notice on, on our um, you know we have a video on oxygen sensing potassium sensing glucose sensing pH sensing uric acid sensing sodium sensing ammonium sensing conductivity but we don't actually have one on a lactic acid detection so we need to do it anyway so we'll do a live streaming um, demo about that so i see signs that your sensor is working but it's not the beautiful results that i would absolutely love so sort of thinking we'll do the live streaming demo 
make you know in front of you and probably send you the sensors so we knew you know and then you can do yours i'll go a bit quicker now it's 8 26 um in london i should really just do in 30 minutes so i'm going to touch on conductivity i'm going to speak a little too fast but let me go quickly right why am i talking about conductivity because i want to talk about how to measure salinity salinity is super interesting you know for applications like water purification um so sorry about that because i wonder i wonder how much um actually came through um just then so i i know i was lost for a little while so i might have to back up slightly and i sort of apologize and i'll go a bit fast um you know so we wanted to um yeah i've backed up slightly so we want to measure salinity in order to measure salinity um you really have to measure um you start off by measuring conductivity um you can measure conductivity using a conductivity probe um conductivity is really the reciprocal resistance we measure resistance by um actually having a um um we, we apply a voltage between two electrodes and we look at the current response if we take the voltage um, divided by the current then we get the resistance if we reciprocate the resistance we get the um, conductivity and if we use the cell constant i.e the um, we take the length between two electrodes and their area we can calculate the cell constant and so conductivity times cell constant gives us spe specific um, conductivity um, now we we, we 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 sort of realized actually that you know you didn't have to use these kind of traditional quite bulky lab um, probes to measure conductivity and in fact we started using our screen printer electrodes and we we sort of discovered um there's a question coming through as well um i'll re i'll answer the question in a minute but we started doing um conductivity measurements using screen printed electrodes um and actually they outperformed as additional conductivity probes um you know and, and I, I think the reason that they outperformed them is because it's not necessary that just two electrodes facing each other is actually the best configuration for measuring conductivity um in fact, you know, we started going with these spiral electrodes because we sort of realized that um, um, if you want to measure impedance in electrochemistry, you often use interdigitated electrodes and a spiral electrode is just a form of interdigitated electrodes. But what we then discovered is, in fact, if we use any of our screen printed electrodes and use them as um, conductivity probes, they all worked so it didn't matter whether we were spiral or using our more traditional what we call 303 configurations and um, they all worked so it tells you that this kind of classic idea that you have to have two platinum electrodes maybe one centimeter square platinum electrodes at a gap of 0 0.1 centimeters apart to measure conductivity it's not true we, we used any we used all sorts of configurations and in fact we weren't even using platinum we were using gold so um i'm just sort of saying yeah if you want to measure um salinity and you want to do it in a low cost way you can use screen printed electrodes as your conductivity sensor now the question is is how do you get from um conduct from conductivity to salinity so i'm just going to um, share a web page that we have so um, hopefully you can see my screen now this is a, a web page that we have so you will measure the I know he's called it admittance here but you will measure the this is because the engineer that I was working with called it admittance this is an engineering let's say another word for um, conductivity but essentially if you want to measure salinity you will put in um, Obviously, if you're developing a product, you wouldn't do it this way. You would you would put it in software. Um, but I'm just kind of showing you very quickly that you can put in the admittance, you can put in the temperature, and it will actually tell you. Then this calculator will then calculate for you the salinity. There's some units out there called PSUs. Some people use ppm. Um, we've also done it so it can calculate osmolarity which people people who are talking about dehydration and hydration use osmolarity 
um, quite a bit. So in order to get from, let's say, conductivity to um, salinity, actually it's quite there, there it's quite a series it's quite a straightforward um, little calculation and we've actually put a little bit of a spreadsheet um, up on the web on how to do it so you will measure your conductivity um, here he's called it admittance but you put it in you put the temperature that you're working at and then it will essentially calculate you salinity in all sorts of units um, I mean I just did you know this calculation was fairly simple because I was a potential chemist, so I could do all the conversions. But just to tell you that if you want to measure salinity, you can do it by measuring conductivity. And then by making some assumptions, then you can actually then calculate salinity. So this will work well in salt and seawater where you can, as you can assume that most of the salinity is from sodium chloride. In other applications, actually, you can't assume it, the the... the um, the conductivity is all from these sodium and chloride ions and in that case um, that sort of assumption falls down but most of the salinities um, most of the salinity um, measurements in the world are done just by conductivity um, if you really want to be accurate you're probably better off using an ion selective electrode um, I mean this is our sodium ion selective electrode so that's probably more um, accurate right now I'm going to um, it's just the last question. I'm sorry it's 8.38 and it's been a bit of a long one. There's a final question that I'll have to answer as well and I will answer it. Um, and I'm going to answer it this way. The, the gentleman was asking, what's the difference between these two um, gold electrodes? This one is made with what we call low temperature gold. So we essentially make it at 150 degrees C. And this one's made with high temperature gold and we make it at about 800 degrees C. We have these two types of gold because sometimes one works better than the other. And we're, we're a sort of commercial company. So the answer, the next question is why? And and I would say for us, it, you know, it's not, it, sometimes the why is not so important as long as it does work. So the direct answer to your question is, um, these are both on our website. One of them is made with low temperature gold. One is made with high temperature gold. When I'm not sure which one to use, I tell people to use the high temperature golds, which is this um, NM. Um, so I think I'm coming to the end of the presentation. I'm sorry it went on so long and I did have a bit of a um, an dropout during that. It's just say I got there's a question here from Rupa. How to perform chrono amperometry without interrupting the steps for various concentrations? Um, I would say this. If you want to do chrono amperometry and you want to change the concentration, um, you might actually want to use this flow cell. Um, so if you're doing chrono amperometry and you want to change um, concentration, um, having a flow cell is one way of doing it. Um, so we've been having this conversation this morning um, about, um, you know, often if, we, if we're doing chrono we you know, these are chrono amperometric experiments. You know, you're stirring the reaction or you're stirring the solution and you just drop in a concentrated um, sample and the signal jumps up you let it reach baseline you drop in another solution and it goes up but that's only a one-way thing you know you can only go up if you want to go up and down in terms of concentration um, then I would suggest actually that you probably talk to um, the guys at um, Technando because I suspect then what you could do is you could use a flow cell. This, so this flow cell, you put the screen printer electrode in there, you can flow the solution over the electrode, and that means then you could change the source of solution, the reservoir. Um, and um, by changing the reservoir, then you would change the concentration. So I hope somewhat that helps a little bit. Now I'm gonna, I am gonna wrap up now because I realize I can't hold you all here all day. You've got jobs and lectures and meetings to attend, so I'll just say thank you very much. Um, and it was long. I'm sorry we had a dropout, but thank you very much. How to measure salinity? You can use conductivity or just use a sodium sensor, an ion selective electrode. Extraction efficiency. We discussed, you know, heterogeneous versus homogeneous samples and what a pain they are. And the difference between the gold electrodes on the ZP website between the 303s One's were made with low temperature gold, 150 degrees C curing. The other one's made at 800 degrees C, um, but 800 degrees C, and that's the high temperature one. I always recommend the high temperature one if I'm not sure. 
Um, but for whatever reason, sometimes we end up using the low temperature one. All right, thanks, Hitchem. Um, thanks, Rupa, for the questions. Ali, thanks for the sonication. And Hitchem, thanks again for also talking about the sonication as well. I apologize, guys, for going on a bit. And I did have an internet dropout, but thanks very much for your um, time this morning. All right, sweet, guys. Take care. And eight, I'm doing the... Um, the news at 8 a.m. on Sundays. I don't expect you to come along at 8 a.m. on Sundays, um, but it'll be up on YouTube afterwards anyway. All right, cheers, take care, and I shall see you next week. Bye-bye.